Hello everyone, Rob B here with Rob D and this week London is calling. Yes, we're looking at the London property market. Is it done? Is it over? Or is it an investment opportunity that you should be taking advantage of? We will give you all the answers this week. Yes, thank you for joining us on The Property Podcast, where every Thursday morning, property investors come together to be informed and inspired. Wherever you're based, wherever you invest, what happens in London has massive knock-on effects for the rest of the country. So we're going to share our thoughts about what's next for London. And if you stick around to the end, we've also got a fantastic hub extra for you as well. But first, deep breaths. So Rob, this is a this is a family show, The Property Podcast. So it's lucky that when we started discussing this new story that our microphones weren't on because I may have said a few swear words. Yep, while our producer fires up the bleep machine just in case we have a relapse, I'll talk you through what has prompted this. So this is a story from The Guardian and the headline is Treasury weighs up tax break for landlords, ooh, sounds good, who sell to generation rent. So we're into budget leaks and predictions and jockeying for position territory now. And this is a proposal from a think tank that the Chancellor supposedly is considering to give a tax break to investors who sell to long-term tenants. So here's the gist. When you sell a property that you hold as an individual, you need to pay capital gains tax on the difference between the selling price and your purchase price, minus your costs and all the rest of it. That for property is 28% minus your annual allowance. What's being suggested is that when a landlord sells a property to a tenant who has been in the property for at least three years, that capital gains tax all goes away and is split equally between the landlord and the tenant. So from the tax that would have been paid, half of it goes to the tenant, so they can use it towards their deposit, making it easier to buy, and half of it comes off the landlord's tax bill, so they've got an incentive to sell that property, and particularly to sell it to the current occupant, rather than to another landlord. Rob, this is a brilliant vote winner. It's a tax break for landlords. It helps out tenants. It means less tax being paid. What's not to like? (laughs) (laughs) I hope no one is paid a salary who works for this think tank. Um, This is just awful. I actually don't know where to start with this one. So let's try and think this through. And it's funny because for a think tank, you'd hope they would have done a bit of that thinking. So first of all, how many people are going to qualify for this? Because when you think, okay, the 28% capital gains, yes, most people have some allowance. As an individual, you've got over 10K. If you're married, you can add your partner, and that will give you double the allowance. So there's tax breaks there that kind of make you think, well, do I need to do this? I can half my tax bill if I go through this measure, but actually I've got that allowance. But obviously that's just one thing. I wouldn't poo-poo it on just one thing alone. The next is, how much do they think this capital gains break is going to be worth? Because yes, okay, if the property is in London, this could make a difference. But there are places around the UK that are barely above 2007 levels of pricing. So it'd be enough to get yourself a Big Mac meal, maybe some extra fries with the capital gains that some of these properties would give, but certainly not enough to make a meaningful deposit. And then, obviously, the restrictions would be to tenants who've lived in the property for three years or more. So the amount of people, again, that could qualify are reduced. And then you think, well, actually, most landlords are going into limited companies these days. So the capital gains structure is completely different and it's taxed in a different way and a lower rate. So this wouldn't apply to them. So wonderful headline, lovely. But the amount of people who would benefit from this would be minuscule. The people who put this down have wasted paper. This is not going to do anything meaningful whatsoever. Yes, if it's announced, it may sound great, but really, this is just a load of drivel that will make little to no impact and will probably be scrapped in a few years because it's seen as ineffective, much like a lot of the other policies that come out over the years, which are lovely headlines, but lack any detailed thought. And it makes you worry, doesn't it, that a think tank full of what seems really well-qualified people when you actually Google who they are and who's involved, and then... Philip Hammond, who's meant to be a smart guy, you know, he's looking after the money, is apparently considering implementing this. Well, after five minutes of reading, you can see this is just a load of nonsense that will have no meaningful impact whatsoever. And believe me, what I said before we started recording was a lot more intense than that. But hopefully you get the idea that I'm not a fan of this one. Well, as if we needed any more objections to it. The thing that really gets me is how it would actually work. And this is where you try to make the transition from something that sounds good to something that would actually be workable. 
But tax that won't be due in future is not the same as a lump sum now that can be used towards a mortgage. So how does that work? As the landlord, do you have to advance it to the tenant? Does the government advance it to the tenant? And who initiates this whole process anyway? If you're the tenant who wants to buy it, do you then have to talk to your landlord who then has to go and work out what their capital gains tax bill would be? And if they get it wrong, how does that work? Who sorts it all out? It just doesn't make any sense. But apparently, Rob, you were wrong. You said that hardly anyone could take advantage of this. Apparently, 88,000 households a year could take it up. There is no way. I don't know what the number would be. Maybe it would be more than zero, but there is no way in the world that 88,000 eligible households would take this up every year. Absolutely no way. That, that's like saying our potential podcast audience is seven and a half billion because there's seven and a half billion people on the planet. Absolute idiots. On the subject of tax, because the government's always coming up with all these mad new things that you need to keep on top of, you're definitely going to need some tax advice when you're starting out in property, but you're also going to need someone to keep your knowledge up to date, do all those filings for you, and it's certainly not getting any less complicated. And that's why we came up with Property Hub Tax. We were forced to set up this service because there was so much demand. And indeed, there has been so much demand that we've been absolutely fully booked to capacity since January, which is why we're only now talking about it on the podcast in October. October for the first time since then. Places are still very limited, but there are actually going to be some places for November and December opening up. There won't be enough for everyone. So if you do want to get tax advice from Property Hub Tax this year, you need to get on the priority list. The way to do that is by going to the propertyhub.net slash tax. That's the propertyhub.net slash tax. Get yourself on that list because that's the only list that we'll be notifying when these places open up. So if you're keeping an eye on your inbox and you're quick enough, you'll be able to snap one up, but only if you're on that list. And if that isn't exciting enough, we've got meetups coming up. Yes, the Property Hub meetups are next week. They're the first Thursday of every month. They're all around the country and the world. So if you've not been to one yet, why not? The year is running out. Come on, make it a goal to get along to one before the year is done. Go to thepropertyhub.net forward slash meetups. That's thepropertyhub.net forward slash meetups. Go along, get your free ticket. Yes, free ticket and network with other wonderful hubbers. It's a laid-back environment where people just get together and talk about something they're passionate about, property. So get along if you haven't already, and if you are a regular, well done. Enjoy your next meetup. Right, our main topic this week is a question that a lot of people will have been asking themselves over the last couple of years, which is, should I be selling up in London? We've talked extensively in the past about how things have shifted, about how London has had a lot of the growth already, how that's now tailing off, how the rest of the country has got some really great investment prospects that are probably better. But does that mean that if you have investments in London already, it's the time to sell them and cash in? Or are the future prospects for London brighter than you might have been led to believe? Well, that's what we're going to get into in this episode. And we're going to give you some specific areas in London to look out for as well. But before we can look at what the future holds, it's important to have a quick recap of what's brought us to where we are now. Let's have a quick wander down London property memory lane. So before the last correction, all the way up to 08, London was flying. And in particular, in 06 and 07, it was double digit growth. Great times. But then, as we know, in 2008, the world started to fall apart and property prices in London suffered, as many other areas did. And actually, in London, they fell faster than anywhere else before. Scary times. But it wasn't long before the recovery kicked in. And actually, London had virtually recovered all the losses by mid-2010. An incredible turnaround. So from the biggest losses to the quickest recovery in the UK. And it grew massively until 2016. But since then... It's stagnated, and in some areas, property prices have fallen a little. So that brings us to where we are now, which is where prices are very high and affordability is stretched. London wasn't exactly an inexpensive part of the country, even before the crisis, but because it's had that big run-up of growth between 2010 and 2016, we're now at a point where the average property in London costs 14 times average London earnings. Now, that is far, far higher than the rest of the UK. When you hear people talking about how bad affordability is in the UK, a large part of that is actually London. Rents as well are very high and can't really get much higher. Rents are determined in large part by people's wages. People's wages in London are higher than they are in the rest of the country as a rule. But rents are taking up such a high proportion of people's wages that until you get significant wage growth, rents can't go a lot higher than they are. 
And indeed, rents over the last year or so have been stagnating, even falling a little bit. Yet even so, if you're buying a property in London, you're going to really struggle to get a yield above 3%, which is extremely low. So whether you're looking at London property as an owner or as an investor, it is expensive by pretty much any measure you can look at. And there are other factors that are putting the dampeners on London as well. The availability of finance makes investing in London really difficult right now as well. Because the rents are low in comparison to the property prices, the majority of property in London fails to pass the mortgage stress tests. So instead of being able to get a mortgage to 75% loan to value, which is pretty much the standard, you actually have to put more funds in and possibly only leverage to 50%. So the amount of capital outlay to be able to invest in London right now is significant. And it's significant with just what you need to put in for your deposit. But on top of that, you've got the stamp duty, which stamp duty generally is expensive in London because of the prices involved. But when you consider that by to let investors now have an additional 3% to pay, it becomes eye-watering the amount of money that needs to go into any London deal. And now there's talk of overseas investors being charged the higher rate of stamp duty as well. All these factors combined means... Property investment in London right now is pretty difficult to justify. It hasn't got a lot going for it. So in order to decide whether there's any investment opportunities in London or whether you should be getting out of London as quickly as possible if you're already invested there, we need to have a bit of a punt at what's going to come next. And this is a difficult one because on the one hand, you've got affordability being very stretched and you think that things can't go a lot further. Also, because valuations are so high, London's particularly vulnerable to mortgages getting more expensive and interest rate rises. The fact that rates have been so low for so long is one of the factors that have put London prices up to where they are. And then from an investor point of view, what about rents? Rents could suffer in London if demand from the EU falls because London is such a popular destination for people coming in to work. So lots of potentially negative factors. But you have to balance that against the fact that London is a global city with loads of employment opportunities, loads of big companies, loads going on, and supply constraints as well. There's only so much land to build on. And if you look at lots of global cities like LA and New York and Vancouver, you see these affordability metrics that are totally different from other cities that are still very significant, but not global cities in the same way. So you weigh those two sides up against each other. It's almost impossible to see prices rocketing up from where they are, but it's also quite hard to imagine a crash. Yeah, we don't see London from where it stands right now. London will probably just tick along. In real terms, it may fall when you take into account inflation for a little while, and it may not do anything exciting for the next few years, but that's okay. It gives time for wages to increase and therefore affordability levels improve to make London attractive once again. So with so much going against it, Rob, the question many people will be asking is, is there anywhere to invest in London right now? Well, there is, as long as you're looking for relative value rather than absolute value. If you're looking for the best short-term growth prospects or you're looking for the best current yields, you're going to find those outside London. But if you want to invest in London because you believe in it for the long term or you're buying for yourself and you're looking to buy in an area that could work as a future investment as well, or you just want to invest near where you live and you live in London, then there are pockets of relative value within London. My kind of general thought on London is that everywhere will gentrify eventually. If you look at what's already happened, you've got places like Hackney and King's Cross and Woolwich, which used to be, let's be honest, pretty awful. And I lived in King's Cross when it was pretty awful. And now those areas have had a lot of money going in and they've completely transformed. That's happened in the past. You're seeing now loads of money going into places like Tottenham and Elephant and Castle and Old Oak Common. Again, not exactly the prime areas, but relatively central, well connected, and therefore ripe for to be transformed by lots of money going in. It now feels like everybody who I know who lives in North London is now having kids and wanting somewhere bigger and moving out to places like Walthamstow and Leighton. So further out again, it's just the ripple effect that we've talked about before, but I think magnified by the fact that there is so much money sloshing around in London that the projects, the developments tend to be bigger. So a lot of money goes in and makes a really big impact. So anywhere where there is relative value, that value will get discovered People will move there, the money will follow, and the prices will rise, as long as the fundamentals are there. And that's the big one. You've got to have the transport links. Or if you don't mind getting in early, you can look for future fundamentals. So those long-term infrastructure projects. At the moment, Crossrail 2 is the one that's been most recently announced. As we've seen with the first Crossrail, it's not that this stuff gets priced in immediately. 
The original crust route was announced absolutely years ago, but all the prices and the rent increases have only really happened in the last few years as that project has come closer to fruition. So it's not the case of by the time it's been announced, it's already too late. If you are willing to take a bit of a gamble and you're willing to wait for that growth to happen, you can get in early by following where the big projects are going. Now you're probably thinking, what if I already own a property in London? Should I sell? Well, if you sell a property in London, I put the capital into the north. Well, then, yes, over the next five years, it's highly likely that you will do better on a capital growth point of view and get a better return on your money as well. But a well-located property in London is always going to do well over the long term. So there's a bit to consider. It's not just as simple as sell up, buy somewhere else because you need to consider transaction costs and the fact that sales in London right now are slow, so you may not be able to get the optimal price for your property that you currently own. Yeah, this is a dilemma that I went through myself because I own property in London and there's one in particular that I was thinking about selling a couple of years ago. It's really interesting because I wrote a blog post about this at the time, which is good because it keeps you honest and it's interesting to be able to look back at how your thinking was and not be able to kind of change what your thoughts were to fit the current narrative. And the logic was, I've got this property, it's doubled in value in about five, six years. It seems to me like it is too expensive for what it is. You look at what's happened in London relative to the rest of the UK, you look at how far the yield has compressed and you think this just cannot carry on. This has got to be the top. Lo and behold, it pretty much was when I was writing that. So based on that, I should have sold it. And if indeed I had sold it and I had taken that money and I had gone and invested it in Manchester... I would have been ahead now compared to where I am, without a doubt. But inertia is a powerful thing. And selling a property is just so much effort compared to other investments. And sometimes that's a good thing. Like you can panic and you can sell shares at times when you couldn't because you can just do it with a click of a button. Whereas selling a property, you really need to think about. But I looked at it. I thought about the capital gains tax. If only that policy had been in place, Rob. And I thought about all the costs that I'd incur in selling and rebuying. And I decided against it because I'd already got all my money out and I'm making a good return on it. So was that the right decision? Well, in purely numbers terms, then no and maybe I'll kick kick myself for it later and I should have seized that window of opportunity because actually getting that sale now with far fewer buyers around I think will be a lot more difficult and I probably wouldn't get the price that I could have done a couple of years ago I certainly wouldn't get the sale so quickly but at the moment I'm pretty happy because I'm still collecting a nice rent I've still got the potential future growth because it's in an area where a lot of regeneration is going on and because it had gone up so much I was able to tap into a lot of equity and still put it to good use. It may not come as a shock to the listeners, Rob, but I think you did the right thing. I know we agree a lot with each other, but what you've done there is exactly what I would have done. Now, that doesn't mean it's right, but hopefully you feel a little better for it. I would have taken the equity out as well. So even though we both feel that the London property market isn't a great place to invest today, and there are much better opportunities out there, it doesn't mean you should sell up. And actually, a much better option is to look at the equity and say, can I put this to better use? Keep that asset in London, but buy other high-performing assets elsewhere in the country. Now, you may not want to rush out and do that. You know, if you're new to investment, it's not something you should embark on lightly. You know, speak to people who understand these things. Get advice. Don't just take money out and start buying left, right, and center. But if you've done property for a few years now, your experience and therefore your comfort levels are okay with this type of strategy, then it may be something to consider. That all being said, Rob, the reason why I think we both feel you should hold the property in London is not because just that it's a bit of hard work to sell, but actually in the long term, London is still a great investment. And while neither of us are planning to invest there in the short term or possibly the medium term, in the long term, we are both very much open to investing in London again. It's just not the right time now, but it doesn't mean London's done forever. No, far from it. London will be a great place to invest one day in the future, but just not today. That's it. It's a great city and demand will always be high. There'll always be lots going on. A well-located property in London will always do very well and it's always going to be very easy to rent. That just doesn't mean that you can pay any price for it. A good investment on paper can transform into a bad investment if you overpay for it. And that is the same anywhere. There will be opportunities in the future to get back into London. Like we mentioned right back at the start of this section, it fell faster than anywhere else in the last crash. We know that another crash will happen. And when it does, if that happens again, which seems likely, if London does suffer the most, that could be a fantastic chance to buy back in. So just because now isn't the time to invest, 
doesn't mean that you should be selling everything and running for the hills, or at least the north. And it definitely doesn't mean that it will never be the right time to invest in London again. So it's nearly time for Hub Extra. I know, I'm excited too. But before we get there, we have to acknowledge two wonderful human beings and hubbers who've left us five-star reviews on the podcast. So first up, we've got one in from Adrian who says, I've been listening to the podcast for just over four months. Rob and Rob are entertaining to listen to and full of useful knowledge. With everything they've taught me, I'm now 100% committed to growing a large buy-to-let portfolio. And I've just bought my first investment at auction. Thanks for all the great advice and keep up the good work. Well, well done, Adrian, on your first investment. And another five-star review in from Justin, who says, A fantastic podcast, useful, informative, actionable, and entertaining. A superb free resource offering so much free content than many of the mainstream property training providers, whose webinars are often an elongated sales pitch. Not so here, not salesy at all. The continued drip feed of relevant content and the drip feed of that regular heartbeat of bite-sized chunks is so important that helps drive the listener to action. Thanks so much, guys, and keep up the good work. Well, thank you guys for leaving us a review. More five-star reviews than any other business podcast, but that's because you've taken the time to do it. So thank you so much to everyone who supports the show. Just time before we clock off for another week for Hub Extra, where every week we just try to squeeze that little bit more into the end of the show and is backed up by the Hub Extra email, which if you are a Property Hub subscriber, you'll get in your inbox first thing every Friday. So Rob, this week, a tool that we have actually talked about before, but not for a very long time, and it's improved a bit since then. Yes, all aboard for this one. It's commutermaps.co.uk. It is, as it sounds, a map that gives you commuter times into key cities around the UK. So you can select multiple cities, including all the ones you would expect, such as London, Birmingham, Liverpool, Manchester, etc. They're all there, and you can get commute times. Why is this important? Well, it's important because many areas will live and die in terms of potential growth based on their commuter links into key towns and cities. So being able to assess different areas and their potential for growth based on their commute times is really useful. Now, it's not going to be the only factor that influences property prices, but it is really important. And what you can often see is that once a city's done well, for example, London or Manchester, that ripple out across areas based on the commute in to those city centres. So if you're trying to be a little bit smart with your next investment and get in before the growth kicks off, then this could be a really useful tool. So to the first class Hub Extra there, and remember, don't miss the Hub Extra email. That lands every Friday in your inbox if you are signed up to the Property Hub, which you should be, because it's free. Right, Rob, it's nearly time to depart. Yeah, I think we've come to the end of the line on this week's episode. Let us know what you thought and let us know what you'd like us to cover on future episodes. We are on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram at Property Hub UK. And believe it or not, we do have lives away from the podcast as well. If you'd like to hear more about what we're up to and how we might be able to help you out with your own property investments, then you can join our next discovery webinar. Sign up for that one at thepropertyhub.net slash discover. We'll see you back here again for Ask Rob and Rob on Tuesday. Until then, have a great week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.